So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's The Art of Lighting with the Light Doctor himself, Simon Perfect. How are you, my friend? Very well, buddy. And you? Yeah, missing you, mate, because we normally have you here about, oh, what, oh, once oh. a month these days, do some filming with us and to do with Edencron. But I know we've been chatting, but it's not quite the same. And uh, we, we were joking earlier, and I and I changed my PCs out in this weird time, and I couldn't find your normal headshot, so I stole this from your Facebook. But it's very cool, my friend. So, um, oh, <laughs> so this is what he always looks very... like. That that is his real face, guys. He is the shark, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, but keeping well, mate, and I know you are because we've been chatting regularly, which is great. Um, Back by popular demand, uh, Simon, to be honest, because obviously we did a recent one for Ellen Crom when they launched the new lighting system. I know you've done some yep. a lot of film for us in the last few years, which has been brilliant. Um, and we're going to do uh, a more regular series on this. We're going to have you back in a couple of weeks, which is great. Um, Simon, before we get going, though, and I hand everything over to you, a little bit of a, you know, it's endless, really. You know, you're, you're an incredible professional photographer. You're um, uh, an Chrome influencer, ambassador for Loxley and Pentax. Does it end? Oh, everything ends somewhere, mate. Um, they're they're the, the, the dregs and uh, and things that have uh, asked me to, to join them and represent them. And uh, I I would only ever use companies and products that, uh, you know, I want to use. I'm, I'm not one of these people that will be paid to say something's good. You know, I, I used Pentax, for instance. I used Pentax long before I was asked to be an ambassador for them. So I need to believe in the product before uh, I... Uh, venture down that road with the company and uh you know the same with Ancrom mate I used it before I joined them so uh it's a product of choice not not something that I just tell people to buy it's something that that I actually believe in so um yeah it's all good brilliant obviously when we're not within these crazy times of uh, lockdown um now obviously we're running the um the training as well as the light doctor so we, we, we've got to talk about that so um the best thing they can do to interact with you is obviously follow you on facebook for now and then obviously when we get back to normality they can start talking to you about uh, possibly getting involved in some of your life and, and you've been doing regular weekly uh broadcasts from your shed right uh, yeah yeah grabbing the kids and uh, giving them a break from home homeschooling uh, and just showing what you can do in a very confined space uh, with the minimum amount of gear, really. And, uh, you know, if people are, we've been fairly basic up till now, but we're going to do some location stuff as well. So I'm, I'm lucky I live in the middle of nowhere, so I can actually walk out the back of my garden and be in fields. So <clears throat> we might uh, grab, the, grab the kids and, and go and do some outside stuff as well over the next couple of weeks. So Brilliant. Looking forward to it, mate. Right, well, we won't waste any more time. As I said, guys, we want you to interact with Simon and I today, so please put your questions through the question panel. I'll ask those where appropriate or we'll allow plenty of time for it at the end. Simon, I'm going to make you the presenter. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, tuning in again. It's um, quite flattering that um, they've had so many uh, requests me to come back, uh, listen to me waffle on. Um, I've put together about 12 images uh, today with lighting diagrams like I did last time, um, just to talk through. Um, and I've kind of, apart from a couple of them, just really to show you what you could do with, with kind of the minimum amount of gear uh and uh you know it might be that you're at home with with confined spaces and i'll talk about the spaces uh as well that i shot these in just because um it shows what you can do with a bit of light control and uh and everything else uh in in these difficult times so uh, i know we're all desperate to be out shooting again and uh you know i feel for every single one of you that can't be at the moment and uh, i hope in you know you're making the best of everything but uh hopefully this will give you some information as i say is there any questions please just ask as we go through because you know uh, that's what i'm here for answer some questions and and uh tell you how things were done in a bit more detail if i don't cover it properly um so uh basically i think most of you that uh, know me and follow me know that i do quite a lot of portraiture uh, i've started a few different things this year started before we uh, got locked down uh, i'm doing a series of images uh, which is one of the first ones i'll show you and some of you will recognize um the first person uh, she may even be watching but uh 
we I decided to to do some sort of boudoir, but I wanted to do some dark, moody, tattooed boudoir. Uh, it seems to be the craze at the moment, and very, very uh, sort of on trend with with heavily tattooed. And uh, I think you know, with the right lighting and the right mood, it can make it look really, really amazing. So this is one of the first images that I shot uh, in a in a boudoir studio, uh, very very small. Uh, but this was just using a strip softbox with a grid. Uh, it was a Photix uh, thirty by one forty uh, softbox, uh, which I was trying out, and uh, something that. Um, we we started to import and distribute, and uh, these soft boxes are all around about a hundred quid each, and uh, very very good value for money. The control you get with a grid uh, on a soft box um, narrows the spread of light and gives you a lot more control. So this is a, a, a strip soft box in a horizontal position, uh, but set up in almost a Rembrandt style lighting. So from the side, you can see where the catch lights are on the top of the eyes. And I just wanted to control it to give this sort of mysterious kind of look to it, look and feel. Um, and uh, I think I got there in the end. Um, and uh, there's two in this this series. But if I give you the lighting diagram for this one, uh, it's very, very simple. You can see that's a strip softbox. The strip softbox was probably three foot away, if that. So in comparison to the subject size uh, it was a large light source which then gives you um, a, a much softer light which controls some of the skin smoothing in camera um, it doesn't give you very hard uh, edge shadows it gives fairly soft edge shadows because the light is so soft uh, and when we go through this later on you'll see I've used some smaller light sources uh, which give a very hard edge shadow and transition between shadow and highlight. So uh, this was the first in the series uh, and then after that uh, we did another one with exactly the same modifier but just with a different spin on it. Very very similar lighting pattern but inside, inside a very very small confined room and to try and control the light bouncing off walls and back into the mirror uh, giving me flare was quite difficult but with a grid it gives you a really pretty nice sort of uh, control of light and it gives you can see the shadow on the shower curtain it, it, it's a soft edge shadow so that tells you automatically that the, uh, the the light is a soft diffused light source. If we'd use a much smaller light uh, in comparison to our subject, the shadow would be really, really hard edged. Uh, and you can see as it feathers off above, uh, going up towards the ceiling, it, it's almost sort of a double edged shadow. You, you get a darker period of the which then fades out. So uh, again, a bit of skin smoothing as well in camera, uh, which allows you to, uh, to, to make it a little bit more feminine rather than making it very masculine looking. So um, I'll show you the lighting diagram for that one. Um, so uh, really bad lighting diagrams, but you get the idea. Same modifier, but in a vertical position rather than horizontal. And you can see by the cat's lights in the eye, they're much longer and thinner. Uh, but it kind of worked because you sometimes see, you know, mirrors with vertical uh, lights standing outside. So it kind of fit the the concept that I was trying to go for, uh, and obviously a reflected image as well. Uh, a bit harder than I thought it was going to be, but uh, I think I got there in the end. So um, that's the first in in that series. I did a couple more which I'm yet to edit, so they may appear at a later date in uh, in another webinar at some point um so we talked about soft diffuse light i'm going to show you the next image uh which is a much harder uh non-diffused light uh and i wanted to create with a minimum amount of gear sort of a hollywood style portrait now the first thing you'll notice with this image is how hard edged the shadows are look how small the catch lights are in the eye uh Basically, I was in a room with uh, this very natty wallpaper uh, and uh, a window behind where I was shooting. And the light that is there is actually a, a, an ELB 400 head with no modifier on it at all, just its standard reflector. So in comparison to my subject, the light was probably 12 to 14 feet away. 
uh, and you can see the dappled on the background where it's, it, there was a, a, a table next to her uh, with a lamp on it. You can see the outline of the lamp and it just makes it feel like there was some very bright sunlight coming through the window. But I wanted to give that kind of 1950s Hollywood portrait style uh, image and just look at the nose shadow, how hard edged it is. So that gives you a really good indication that the light was very hard um it was uh, it was unmodified and just as you would expect to see with sun streaming through a natural window so this was a bit of a balance of daylight and flash but uh, obviously to give it the exact uh look and feel that i wanted to uh, to to achieve so this uh is the lighting diagram and literally it is as simple as that you could do this with a flash gun um although you would be running out of power at that sort of distance, you need to get the flash gun in a little bit closer, but just due to the nature of the flash gun, it's such a small point source of light that it's gonna give you uh, a very hard, undiffused light. Uh, you've gotta make sure you've got the right model um, because if she's got bad skin to start with, um, this is gonna show every single imperfection and uh, she's never gonna thank you. Uh, this model, uh, is known as Porsche uh, or Valis, Valis Valkova. Um, she was in Game of Thrones. I believe she was one of the prostitutes in Game of Thrones. Uh, but she's a lovely, lovely girl. Uh, she's a, a, a plus size model uh, and uh, just absolutely gorgeous. She's beautiful and very, very curvy and just very womanly. Very nice to see these days. So that's kind of a, a Hollywood style take with the minimum amount of gear. Uh, back in the olden days, they used to use Fresnel spotlights and things. We used to better focus the light and uh, sharpen up the shadows and everything else through a ground glass screen. Uh, this is done with the minimum amount of gear that's uh, that's un unmodified. So uh, I will move on to my next image, uh, which is shot. I've done this with a lighting diagram underneath. So this is a shot I did a few years ago, actually, and uh, playing with daylight and flash. Um, the flash you can see uh, is basically relieving the uh, what would be a silhouette because of where the sun is. The I was probably stood thirty foot lower down than the model. Uh, she was up on a, a, a sort of a hilltop, cliff top uh, in Portugal, actually. Um, and the light is just out of camera. Uh, again, it's just a standard reflector that's lighting her balanced with the daylight to give the impression she's looking up into the sun. Uh, but it gives this lovely texture uh, onto the um, onto the, the white material. Uh, it highlights the edge of her and separates her from that blue background. Now, uh, that was shot at around about a thousandth of a second uh, on sort of a high sync type uh, situation basically to give me uh, that blue sky because if I'd have shot against it at 125th at my standard flash sync it would have just been washed out and uh, wouldn't have looked uh, as good as this it doesn't it wouldn't the white dress wouldn't have popped out uh, of, of the blue so again just using really really simple setups that you can uh, you can make to be effective uh you know is, is what i do and as i said before and i'll say it many many more times in my life i am a very very lazy photographer and if i don't need to get three lights out to do a shot i'm not going to uh this is uh this is something that i enjoy doing out uh, out on location simon mate gonna so, jump, sorry mate just going to jump in with a qu question on this image um yeah in relation to the model, how high in the sky was was the uh, sorry? How high is the light in relation to the model on the cliff? Was it much higher than that sign? Uh, the light on the stand would have been at its maximum uh, reach. So we're probably talking uh, about six and a half, seven foot, because it was only a little travel stand I was using, uh, angled down as if as if the light is is coming, you know, from the sun. So um, yeah, it would have been as high as I could have got it, um, and uh, just out of camera shot on the uh, on my camera right. Brilliant. Um, and while I'm, while we're there, just one other question. Might as well address it now. Um, any sp are you choosing any specific uh, s settings on camera, or is that desired on the shot that you're taking? Is that does that make sense? 
Uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 it all depends on where I am and, and what gear I've got to use. I mean, you know, for years and years when I shot film, uh, I taught everybody that F8 was the go-to aperture, like everybody did. Uh, it, it, it was kind of uh, what, what, what we did and what was acceptable. Um, this uh, shot, um, as I said, was a high sync um, shot just to darken the ambient down and control that blue on the background. Um, I looked at this actually the metadata yesterday. Uh, this was shot at 5.6 uh, and it was shot at just about a thousandth of a second. So um, the, I remember this this Portugal trip and it was absolutely blistering. I mean, it was it was mid mid 30s at least, uh, completely unbroken sunshine. And we trekked a long way to get to this place. Uh, so the sun was brutal um but yeah i mean it, it depends i mean that that hollywood portrait that i showed before was shot wide open at sort of two eight um this one's at 5.6 and uh they vary just depends on the situation and what effect i'm looking for at the time brilliant thanks mate it's all yours okay so the next one uh there's a story behind this and it's a little bit different from the stuff that i normally shoot um I'd always wanted to produce uh, an image. Now, the first thing people do is they look at the shot, and I do, I cringe slightly because it looks like it was color popped. This is straight out of camera. There is no editing on this shot whatsoever. Um, it basically, if I show you the idea behind it, uh, I'm a, a, a Bristol boy and uh, we have a very famous uh, graffiti artist called Banksy, uh, and I'll go show you the lighting diagram. I'm sure you all recognize the little girl with the balloon. It was one of his favorite, um, his, his famous shots. I always wanted to do something around this and create something uh, that, that I wanted to do, but this was always in the back of my mind. So the lighting setup on this is very, very straightforward. All I wanted to do was get a pure white background. So uh, I always light a white background uh, at one stop overexposed that's enough to give me a perfectly white background without any spillback to the subjects um i don't want to glow like a ready brett kind of glow around the the uh the subjects uh in my images i want to control that white background so one stop over my working aperture one stop brighter will give me that white background and as i said this shot is completely straight out of camera the light in the back corner is a snooted light now i don't like snoots they're very very 70s 80s uh modifiers they do have their purposes but with a grid on from that distance at a fairly high power i was able to aim the light through the balloon and illuminate the balloon so whereas a lot of people would have colored that in afterwards i thought you know what i've got that light there i'll stick a snoot on it it saves me a load of work afterwards it's literally lit straight through that balloon from probably 10 feet away. But because of the narrow control of a snoot, it allows you to illuminate one part of that subject or that image uh, without contaminating the rest of it. You'll see that the figures aren't quite silhouetted and I wanted a little bit of detail in there. I didn't want them to just be black figures. Uh, I wanted some detail in there. So there is a little bit of detail coming through. Um, You've probably not noticed it, but one of my biggest regrets with this shot is I wish I'd got the little girl to take her glasses off. Um, but I've left it in there. It's as raw as it came out the camera. <clears throat> I've just done a, a square crop on it, that's it. Uh, so just playing with light and, uh, you know, again, you could do this with flash guns. Uh, you could point that light directly through the balloon uh, and illuminate it. And uh, I think, you know, if you get away from the color pop, uh, that was common a few years back. Uh, when you actually know the story behind it, you can you can see how it was done and and how effective it is. So um, yeah, just a little bit different from me. Kind of jump in so again because we're getting questions on each yeah. image at the moment, but um, no, good, good. the um, the aperture for the models was that uh, underexposed. Uh, the, I, I chose a working aperture, which basically was the exposure for the balloons. So my working aperture on this, I didn't need a great deal of depth of field. So my working aperture was f4, uh, and that's what I exposed for the 
for the balloon and everything else just fell into place. So um, there, there is no sort of science to it really. I exposed for the brightest part of the image, which was the balloon, which has then darkened everything else off. But because the background is one stop overexposed, it all comes together and gives you that uh, that look and feel. And the uh, the snoot on the uh, balloon, mate, how far away would you say that is? About 10 feet and directly through it. So exactly the same height as the middle of the balloon, uh, just, just illuminating it uh, through. If anything, it was very slightly feathered angle towards the background, hitting the back of the balloon so that it didn't, didn't sort of white out the middle of the balloon. So just wanted a bit of light coming through to show that it was uh, was a proper balloon filled with helium. It's not added afterwards. Right. And um, just for clarity then, the two lights that are obviously light in the background, how far from the background would you say they were roughly? Uh, probably five feet. Brilliant. Thank you, mate. Oh, and you did yeah. say on the snoot, you did have a grid, wasn't it? I did. Um, the, the reason being, a snoop by by its very nature will, with without a grid on the end, will give you. If you point one at a background, it will give you a double-edged shadow. Um, I don't know the science behind it. It's a black tube. The light comes through. It gives you a very very funny double-edged shadow. Putting a grid on the front of it controls that light. Gives you a much tighter pool of light, but only gives you a single-edged shadow. Uh, which is what it was needed. If I had the grid off that, it would have illuminated some of the top of the uh, older model's head. Uh, it would almost have illuminated the string on the balloon as well, giving me a highlight or blending it into the white background. So, um, I, I, you know, I didn't want that. It was all about control. So the gridded snoot is great and the kits that are available uh, all come with a grid anyway. So it uh, works really, really nicely. And you said it was straight out of camera, so the balloon itself was that colour. There's no been no retouching on that, has it? I not all. All I have done to that image is cropped it square. I haven't touched it. Perfect. Thank you, mate. All right. So uh, the next one, we're going outside again, uh, and again, uh, just to show you uh, how simple things can be. Again, there is no trickery in this image. The only thing that I have done is done a bit of uh, skin smoothing. Um, I haven't tidied up her hair because I wanted her to look a bit beachy. Uh, the sun is the sun. There is no trickery on that. There is no filters used. There is no manipulation in Photoshop. That's exactly what the sun was doing. It was behind. Um, and it was giving me this beautiful rim light. You can see around her, her arms and her forearms, uh, the back of her hair. It's just great. But again, it was brutal. I was nearly blind enough to take this shot. I was down very, very low. Uh, Isla is a lovely model. Um, she, again, is quite curvy. Uh, and you have to be very careful about the angle that you shoot. You'd never want to shoot above her because her legs could look bigger than they are. Uh, I wanted to give the impression that her legs were longer, you know, went all the way up to her armpits. And because I've shot at such a low angle, it's made her legs look a lot, lot longer. Um, it's high sink again because the sun would obviously have just bleached everything out completely. So this shot was shot uh, around about a four thousandth of a second. Uh, this was on my 645Z. Uh, so four thousandth of a second. Because the sun is in the image, it's basically made the sky very, very blue uh, and the sun has been controlled by the fast shutter speed. If we'd have shot again at 125th or 250th, uh, the sun would have bleached everything out. You wouldn't have been able to see the sun. It would have just been a big white background. Uh, so controlling the light is very, very important in a situation like this. And again, like the girl on the cliff top, you're using your main light, which I'll put the diagram up now, to fill in what the sun would leave black in the background. So instead of having a silhouette, you have to control where the light goes. Now, the reflector that I used on this was a 26 centimeter high performance reflector. Uh, it's about 14, 15 inches long. It's got a, a, a width on it of about 10, well, 26 centimetres uh, across. 
So um, it, it throws and projects the light, but also gives you a very controlled light in terms of how it comes out. It doesn't come out massively wide, and you'll notice that the exposure from the top of the head down to the, the feet gradually, just very gradually, just drops off, but only by a half a stop, if that, but there's enough to control what's, uh, what's down there and keep the details. So, Again, I love doing this. I love pushing the kit to the extreme to, to, to show what, what it can do. Uh, and this is um, this is shot again with the, the Allen Grom ELB 1200 unit. Uh, I think this was the first year it had come out and I took it to, again to Portugal. Uh, same girl as on the cliff top. Um, so, you know, you can see the different looks and feels you can get using different modifiers and, uh, and things like that. Actually, it wasn't the same girl, it was a different girl, but they do look very, very similar. Um, so again, light from behind, you got something, Jay? Uh, no, sorry, I thought you were moving on, because I want to talk about this image. So you carry on, and then we'll go back to the image, mate, sorry. No, that's fine. I've, I've, I've just about to move on to the next one, unless there are any questions on this one. Uh, yeah, no, there was. Well, uh, as well, you think you just touched on it, but we've had a couple of questions on... Um, the recommended lighting for overpowering the sun on location. So obviously you said this was a few years ago. What what would you say is, is the right kit for them now, mate? Well, overpowering the sun is always going to be difficult because it depends on where you are. I mean, I've got away with overpowering the sun in Cuba with a 400 watt unit. Um, and uh, obviously the sun there is, is extremely brutal. Um, it's all about control. So if you had a 400 watt unit that was just a standard flash, you're never going to overpower the sun. What we have to do is use a high sync technique or high speed sync technique, which allows you to use a much faster shutter speed and control the ambient light at the same time. So if you take the ELB 400, the Quadra that uh, I know quite a few of your uh, um, experienced members own uh, we've got the new version the ELB 500 they'll both do it in a high sync situation and up to you how high a shutter speed you go that the higher or the faster the shutter speed the less ambient you can record so you know if you're shooting on a DSLR at 8 thousandth of a second you could almost make this shot look dark and, and like night time um, I'll show you a, a picture in a minute that uh, is using that particular principle um, but um, you can get away with a 400 with a high sync head you can get away with the LB 500 with a high sync head you'd struggle to get this shot with a flash gun because you've got around about 50 watts of power maximum so you're soon going to run out of power uh, with your flash gun um, my go-to location kit uh, is a, an ELB 1200, which is 1200 watts. But again, even abroad, you know, I'm normally around about four to 600 watts. So again, there's an argument there is, do you need that bigger kit? You, you can go for a, a much smaller um, and, and less cost kit to, to get around it, as long as you use the right technique to do it. The focal length on this, was it uh, 28 millimeter, did you say? I can't remember. Uh, I didn't mention the focal length. Um, okay. This one was a uh, 150 uh, on my medium format, uh, which is the equivalent of about 100, 100-ish mil on a, a DSLR, somewhere around about there. Um, so again, to keep the perspective, uh, I don't like using wide angle lenses too much when I'm shooting portraiture because you can very easily distort the aspect of the image uh, and especially when I have leading lines here from the, the tiles at the bottom of the wall, the railings and the top of the wall itself, trying to keep everything kind of in perspective without stretching things is, is really important um, and also when you have a girl that's a bit curvier, again you want to keep the lines straight, you don't really want to start you know making things look wider than they are, which is quite a, a, an easy thing to do. So uh, I very rarely use wide angle lenses on portraits, uh, if I can help it. DSLR wise, I shoot uh, an 85mm uh, on my, my uh, 645Z, it's either a 120 or a 150mm. Uh, did you say there was a reflector used in this one? No, 
no. exactly as the lighting diagram. So the reflector on the front of the unit uh, was my modifier, uh, but uh, that's it. There's there's nothing else. Oh, I see. Right. Just, just, um, just a reflected dish on, on the light. Okay, brilliant. Um, how did you minimise lens flare? Using a lens hood uh, and controlling, I mean, you can see the flare that's, that's come down from the sun. It's, it's got this sort of created its own starburst almost. And because of the intensity of the sun, you can see this flare around the sun, but using the lens hood, and I also tend to put my hand over the top of the lens as well to extend the lens hood. Because when I look through the camera, you can actually see some flare coming down across her face. Uh, I didn't want that. So if you extend the lens hood with, the, your, with your hand and curve it around the top of the, the, the lens hood, you make it longer and therefore you stop that, that sun hitting the top of the lens and creating the flare across the face. Brilliant. And one last question. It's a bit more of a techie one. Um, how high, uh, let me read it again. With high speed sync, how fast can you push the ELB 400? You can with 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 the HS head. Um, you can push it on most DSLRs to eight thousandth of a second. Um, you can uh, on my medium format only goes up to four thousandth of a second. So that was kind of my my limit anyway. Um, you can push it hard, and to be honest, the the you know with any high sync situation, you'll be on fairly full power. Um, so on a 400 taking this shot, I would imagine I'd have been up at six, which is its maximum power on the A channel. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a trade off. You know, I don't like pushing packs to their, their, their limit all day long in blistering sunshine. But to be honest, if you've got to do it, you've got to do it, uh, which is tend to be if I'm teaching abroad, I take the 1200 because it's only working at half power and therefore I'm not stressing it too much. And, you know, it's not every shot you take is at high sync anyway. Some of the shots you want to be balanced in daylight with flash and everything else. But this is, you know, even if you shot at 250th or 500th of a second, you'd retain that blueness of the sky. Anything less than that with that bright sunlight, you're going to start washing the sky out. And I think the image will just lose its impact a bit. So, Brilliant, mate. Back to you, pal. Okay. Um, so the next one uh, is completely different. Uh, this was shot in a caldera of a volcano. Um, got up at ridiculous early hours of the morning uh, for this in Lanzarote and it was uh, very grey and misty and it was horrible. You couldn't see the sun at all. So I had a play with this. Uh, that sun behind is actually a flash head um, on a boom. Uh, it's a quadra head. Uh, I like playing with flare. Uh, and there's another image later on uh, that, that has the flare coming straight through the camera. Uh, and I'll explain that when we get to it. But this one basically is a very, very simple lighting setup. Um, just a little bit different and just trying to play. So you can see uh, behind the model to the, the, the left, there is a light shining straight through into the camera. And it gives the idea on this one, it's either the sun or the moon, depends on how you want to interpret this shot. Uh, and then a gridded softbox on the, uh, the right of my camera, feathered across the front to highlight the metallic dress, to highlight the uh, material, but feathered to a point where it misses quite a bit of the, the, the widest part of the material and leads you into the brightest part, which obviously is, is our model. The light behind, although it's acting as a sun or a moon, it's actually giving you a very nice rim light as well to separate the model from the, uh, from the background, especially because it's quite dark and moody uh, and everything else kind of just looks after itself. But, this was just a bit of an experiment for me, and I thought I'd put it in there to show what you can do when you're trying to fight against elements, whether it be too dark and gloomy or whether the sun be too bright. Uh, you can add in your own sun uh, and have a play with it. And, uh, you know, obviously I have to, to clone out the boom pole on it, otherwise it would have looked a bit odd. But, uh, you know, this is this is not had a lot done to it. And I like trying to sort of take images that, haven't had a massive amount of work done to them, but uh, sometimes depends on who you're photographing, you, you have to do it. So just something a little bit different, I thought I'd throw in there for you. Um, 
The next one is a very, very simple beauty setup. Uh, this is something that uh, I enjoy doing. Um, and this shows kind of what I like to do in terms of skin. I like the skin to be smooth, but I like to see detail. So pores and, and uh, minor blemishes. Uh, this was really as, as a sort of a makeup type shot uh, showing the the girl's sort of talent in terms of eye makeup and and whatever i shot for a couple of hours with this girl th this day and it was one of the very first shots i did with my 645z and uh i didn't notice it but the camera is so brutally honest uh she had a blackhead at the end of her nose <laughs> and uh every image that day once i'd seen it i couldn't unsee it so i had to uh to uh, clone it out on the end of her nose but it was ridiculous i mean nothing can be hidden when you when you're shooting on medium format this again is a 150 mil lens uh the lighting uh style is uh is on the next slide and again it's just feathered off but the softbox was a lot higher than she was so i wanted almost to have a rembrandt style but but i didn't I wanted the wraparound of the light, even though it was gridded, to kind of come around the other side of her face uh, and, and to give me a little sort of triangle. And you can see there's a triangle of light, but then it kind of fades into shadow, but very subtle shadow because of the, the wraparound. Uh, and having the light up higher, uh, highlighted the top of her cheekbones and everything else. So it was just putting the light exactly where I wanted it, but to keep this kind of really natural skin look uh, at the same time. So. Um, yeah, I was pleased with that. And again, I, I could be really, really fussy. I've never used this shot for much, but I, I could uh, clone out and, and uh, tidy up some of the hair. But again, this is all about a lighting pattern and, and trying rather than uh, making the image look absolutely perfect afterwards. So the next shot, we we're talking about uh, flare. Um, this next shot uh, is still one of my favorite shots. Um, Basically, it was during a lunch break uh, on a training course, and I wanted to replicate like a sunglasses type advert. I didn't have a high sink head with me, so this is shot uh, with a um, uh, a Quadra ELB 400. It was actually the Quadra 400 back then. Uh, the sun is my main light, so the sun is behind me, uh, and the flare is a bare Quadra head. Um, so this is what you'd see if you were stood in the middle of uh, the Portuguese uh, sand dunes and the sun coming through, you, you know, you'd see this exact thing. I was trying to replicate uh, what, what you'd actually see um, with your own eyes. So because I didn't have enough power to fight the sun, I used the sun to my advantage. I lit the subject with my sun and the flare from the back is the bare head. And you can see this uh, on here as a lighting diagram. It just gives a, a really nice effect. And again, you wouldn't want to use it all the time, but again, pushing boundaries and, and showing what you can do with the minimum amount of gear, gear uh, is key. And I, you know, I've cleaned out the stand because obviously the light was on a stand behind, uh, but about it for retouching, but again, a real sort of beachy, beachy look rather than uh, a, a polished image. Um, the next one is quite dark and moody. Um, this was shot on one of my training courses in a nightclub in Watford. And there's a couple of images in this series. Um, I quite often get asked whether it's appropriate to use a beauty dish to shoot a guy. Um, absolutely, 100% definitely. Um, I love the look and feel, and to be honest, guys don't tend to be quite as hung up on their skin as as, uh, as ladies do. Um, we like to look a bit more sort of rough and rugged. And those who saw my last uh, webinar with uh, Photographer Academy will, will probably recognize this guy uh, with his girlfriend who was with him. Um, he, he was the loveliest guy in the world, and he was up for messing about and playing. Uh, but I just wanted to make him look really dark and moody. Uh, it's a, a butterfly lighting setup. Um, so although the diagram that I have put together, 
doesn't show it exactly. That light actually is coming right directly from above his head, shining down across his face, which gives... I got him to stand back very slightly because I didn't want his whole eye sockets to be illuminated. I wanted them to be very, very slightly darker at the top to give this really kind of moody look. And you can see the very dense nose shadow underneath that goes into his moustache uh, and the hard shadow under his chin. It gives a, sort of this moodiness to him. Uh, when he opened his mouth, you know, he'd have been the sort of guy who took your, your granny shopping, he was lovely. But uh, I think this portrays him as somebody completely different and uh, gives him this really sort of mean and moody look. But that's with a gridded beauty dish to keep the spill off the back wall as much as I could. Uh, and your your eyes automatically are drawn to his face uh, and uh, this sort of really sort of menacing look that, uh, that, that he gives you. But um, yeah, a bit, bit different. Um, next one, uh, I did a series of fitness uh, shots a while ago, uh, playing with gels and, and everything. This girl's local to me. Uh, she's a, a, a boxer, but she also runs a, a, a fitness gym as well. Uh, her husband's an ex-professional boxer. And uh, I just, it was a friend of mine goes there and, uh, and she recommended that uh, she spoke to me about getting some images done. So we did a series of images for her website and everything else. Uh, and I wanted to have a play and she was up for anything. It was brilliant. Um, so we played with gels. I walked into this gym and uh, it was just clinically clean. It was all white and bright and I wanted to make it look a bit sort of dark and moody. So we put some smoke in there. Uh, we put a blue gel and a red gel behind her, just illuminating the white walls. Uh, and then I lit her with an umbrella from the front. Now, one of the deep parabolic umbrellas that uh, I use uh, quite often, uh, 125 centimeter silver brolly. You can put a diffuser on it if you want to, but I didn't want to on this instance. I wanted to just highlight sort of the sweatier areas. Uh, it was actually baby oil that she put on rather than uh, real sweat. Uh, so we wanted to highlight areas to show that she was glistening, she'd been working hard and, and everything else. Just catching the tires, but then washing the light across the front of her just to highlight those muscles. Uh, the highlight from the red gel and the blue gel from behind is, is very subtle, but just really giving some kind of depth and feel to the image uh, using those uh, different colored gels. So that's that one. Uh, this one I shot for Ellen Crom, and this was done in your studio, Jay. Um, of the lovely Kelsey and we were playing with the big black leather chair and a uh, very, very simple lighting setup again. Um, I'll show you the lighting diagram on here. Great big 135 centimetre octagonal softbox. Uh, the video is online uh, on the Photographer Academy YouTube and the Flash Centre. Um, this softness of light is lovely. So. 135 octa uh, camera right and it's washing across the subject again feathered because I wanted the, the light to just clip the edge of the sofa to show the chair to give some detail in the uh, in the arms and the back of the chair and then from behind is a separation light so you can see down you know as you look at the image on the left hand side there's a light going down the side of her arm which separates her from the background top of the head down the side of the hair to show in that she's a three-dimensional object uh, and we also get this nose shadow so I suppose if you were going to call this lighting anything it's not quite Rembrandt uh, it, it's more loop because of the style of the nose shadow coming out to the side it was a little bit direct uh, and because the softbox is 90 degrees ish I mean a true feather as as, uh, as we know is a, a 90 degree to the subject uh, this is very slightly off 90 degrees, so it's not quite a, quite a feather, but it's similar. The light's washing across the front, controlling where it goes. Separation light literally just kicks in at the back, uh, just to give some depth and uh, and to show that she's a three dimensional subject. So, really. That's it. There's my 12 images with some very, very simple, but I hopefully you'll find them effective lighting setups. 